Hello, everyone. You are listening to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gautier Lamotte, your host, and today my guest is Frank Human, VP of Business Development at Secomind.ai. Hi, Frank. Hello, Gautier. How are you? I'm very well. It's 9.30 p.m. in the U.S. Uh, in France, sorry. And what time is it in the U.S.? Uh, I'm on the West Coast uh, in the Silicon Valley right now, so it's about 12.30 in the afternoon. I love it. All right. Bye. So... Tell me, what is it that you do at Secomind? Ah, yes, I'm happy to. So Secomind is a, a team of engineers, and we develop AIs of many sorts. That shows up in, in a lot of different ways. Um, we have trained, our, our team is over 100 engineers and have been working on this for over five years. So we've trained over 5,000 different models. Um, you know, many of which are, are active in uh, physical world devices today. So uh, stuff that, that plays in the IoT space and the, the actual physical device realm. Um, so this is going to be, you know, lots of like facial point recognition or, uh, you know, different types of like predictive, uh, predictive algorithms for failure points on machinery. Uh, we also um, have been have been botting more recently and kind of bolting uh, multiple AIs into one um, software system as a, as a software platform mm -hmm. in order to, um, you know, interpret natural human language as well as uh, use use those types of controls to gain inferences about the world or or other software products and be able to ha have have a, a smart system that that will, you know, enact a, a lot more than than a single person could do you know in in any short amount of time wonderful and we came in contact with each other because you met my uh, business partner francois rené rideau at uh, a convention which was a blockchain convention so allow mm -hmm. me to ask what were you doing here yes i was at east denver um if you know it and many of the listeners will probably also know it it's quite a large uh, quite a large blockchain event uh, um <clears throat> Full of enthusiasm and energy and wonderful people, uh, such as Francois. And I was there in sort of investigation mode. Um, I mean, obviously have community and, and friends uh, within the blockchain space and within the Web3 community who have been doing this for quite some time. Um, but I I am, am in, the, in the open curiosity of how does AI actually play with Web3? You know, we've seen a, a dip in let's say the, the market itself mm -hmm. but if i look at ETH denver uh the way that it was last year and the way that it was this year so there's a dip in the market right like the the price of the coin is different but there were twenty thousand people at ETH denver last year and fifty thousand people at ETH denver this year so what that says to me is there is still this trend this is a technology that's definitely not going away and i am very curious on how um how do we stay ahead of the curve and how do we uh, you know, how can I integrate AIs and Web3 stuff to, to create systems eventually that will be very meaningful uh, in the future? Wonderful. All right. So I love it because we already had a, another AI expert uh, for, for an interview on our Mutual Knowledge blog. And mm -hmm. what are the possible crossovers from blockchain to AI or from AI to blockchain, in your opinion? What's the, the most interesting thing um, that you think of? So there's uh, there's a few different categories and, and ways to think about that. Um, the, the short answer is we don't know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Those uh, These are both systems that are evolving so rapidly uh, you know, that, that we don't really have um, all of, of the answers or, or can even predict what's going to happen. There are some things that we can anticipate, right? Um, and, and those happen in a few different categories. I, I've heard of people discussing the, the notion of on-chain AI, you know, stuff that will uh, be used to uh, clean up, look at uh, transaction histories, you know, make, make decisions on where to validate, um, you know, where to validate transactions, et cetera. That's less my area of focus. My area of focus is more in the realm of how do we use AI systems now and integrate a blockchain where we need to have um, distributed systems of record. Mm -hmm. All right. And so what would you think, for example, of AI's uh, verifying code and making sure, automating code in general, making sure that... Uh, um, that the code is correct and that uh, it's efficient because some people are saying that this is a trend and some of the people are saying basically this is super dangerous because one little bug in the field of blockchain and you could lose all your assets. 
So what do you I think mean, about that trend? We've seen bugs and we've seen hacks and people have lost uh, <laughs> small fortunes or large fortunes um, through that. And and actually, I think that the AIs in, in that capacity uh, will be of integral importance um, to the Web3 industry moving forward because I, um, a lot of the challenges that have come in Web3 have been around the not 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 trust in terms of the technology but the trust in terms of the broader group of of humanity trusting that that technology is going to be reliable because we've all heard the horror stories we've seen you know uh we, we we've seen we've seen the fortunes lost we've seen the 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 scam <laughs> the scam coins come and the scam coins go right and and so a lot of people are are wary to engage um, you know, that that is obviously smoothing out like, uh, you know, ETH right now and, and Bitcoin are, are seemingly quite stable are, you know, still valued very high. I think that there's a there's a lot more that that comes in that realm. But being able to audit the code or look at the uh, look at the, the code that, that's operating so we don't have tiny micro leaks uh, built within systems later um, will uh, I, I, th I think we'll represent the, the kind of the next level in stability um, for the ecosystem. Wonderful. All right. And what would you think, for example, uh, of the AIs fueled by blockchain nodes? Some uh, some blockchain projects appeared last year. Basically, they were using nodes to to uh, nourish a uh, neural network and to basically power it. Uh, what's the, your take on that? Um, talk to me a little bit about what uh, the applications is something that, that you see, like if that might be able to steer. Well, basically, the, the computational power was shared between users and mm -hmm. each operator of a node, each person lending uh, computing power was basically using that computing power to feed the neural network and the integrity of, uh, of the AI so that people do not tamper with the, the neural network were assured by the, the fact that it's mm -hmm. on the blockchain. I'm not competent enough to have an advice on this, which is why I'm asking yeah, yeah. you about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose my, my thoughts are, um, I'm in business, right? In mm -hmm. business development. So I'm always thinking about uh, what's a critical application. I'm, I'm not as much on, on the on the like extended research front. And so if, if I look here, I say, where's the practical use case for this? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's in uh, some sort of medical system. Let's say where you know you 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 want to have that type of uh, data processing distributed. You want to have um, different people, let's say, compensated for their contributions to that. You know, in, in medical, right now, uh, the hospitals get all of the money for all of the research, <laughs> right? From from the data that gets fed into some sort of a, some sort of a research group, like they're the ones that they get compensated for that. I think that having uh, building a system that would that would be able to track uh, where that's coming from, have lossless data, and be able to um, like learn learn more efficiently what that looks like. I, I, I'm on, I'm on kind of out on my own edge here, but that's that's some area that I think it, it, it could be some value. The technology seems plausible and it seems really cool. It, it'll be high computation power. So that's that's what I mean on the business case, right? There will be, there, there, there's a high cost to running a system like that now. And so if there's something that's like a high value or critical application, then I would say that's probably where we would see something like that show up first. But I'm not tracking uh, any projects right now that are, um, you know that, that require that that's fascinating uh, that's what, typically why i ask it's not necessarily for the the technical aspect but also for the business cases you would think of and what you think about it philosophically and so mm -hmm. this brings me to another question there is that strong debate between the people um in the field of ai and the people in the field of uh, of blockchain and what i like when i can you know <laughs> <laughs> get get a get a hold of somebody who's got a foot in both worlds. Um, some people think that AI is basically going to go through a lot of automation and centralization of power, and blockchain is going to be an attempt at decentralizing power. Of course, it's very simplistic and Manichaean because we know that governments want to have their own private blockchains, so that's not going to be decentralized in any way. And we know that many people already used um, AIs to 
empower themselves and to fight some some kind of government corruption uh, already. So it's not exactly AI versus blockchain, but what's your take mm -hmm. on that still? What do you think the, the real Web3 will look like? Is it going to be the Web3 where basically an AI thinks instead of you and because it looks at your heart rate on your uh, connected watch, on your smartwatch is going to think, oh, that dude needs a Diet Coke, so I know he likes it. So you come back to your place and it's already been delivered and the AI has been uh, browsing all the auctions to find the cheapest Diet Coke to have it in your fridge. And oh, thank you, Chad GPT, you're so nice. I love it when you bring my Diet Coke. Uh, and on the other hand, people thinking, oh, there's going to be a bunch of super educated guys who are... Uh, trying to use the blockchain to be genuinely decentralized. But, of course, the, the, the world is going to be a mix of it. But if you wanted to, to imagine the, the future, how, how do you think these two worlds would merge with each other? Well, how I want to think about it and how it will show up may be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, that that type of an argument is, uh, is like, like you said, it's, it's not necessarily one or the other. Um, and it, if I look at it... <clears throat> like that, I look at the previous systems that we've had, right? The previous systems that we've had of interpreting the world and, and taking action on uh, our desires or things that we want would be, let's say, religion and science, right? Those things seem like they're uh, like oil and water on, on some level. And then on other levels, uh, I, I don't think it's like that at all. Like, why would those things not coexist or overlay, you know, mm -hmm. uh, religion or, you know, a broader spirituality, mm -hmm. if you will, right, is, is a way that we interpret um, a lot of things that we don't understand about the world, mm -hmm. right? And then science is a way that we look at and try to measure a lot of things that we don't understand about the world. And those things can coexist very peacefully. It's funny when when someone will fall to one camp or the other. I don't know if, it, if, if it's out of... Uh, you know, out of some sort of like <laughs> ego driven need to like identify with, uh, you know, with, uh, with some system or find some purpose in life to, you know, to focus their efforts and feel good uh, about waking up in the morning or, or, or what that looks like. I think that AIs and, and Web3 in, in as, a, as an allegory or as an analogy will very much be able to exist uh, in the same way. Yes, there is something that's, that's, um, extremely rapidly um, polarizing about AI, right? Like you look at someone who has money to invest in an AI system that can then gobble up a bunch of jobs, right? Then if, if you're looking at something like that, yeah, yeah, it, it can filter up to, to a centralized power system in, in some fashion. Um, until we hit AGI and then who knows? <laughs> Who knows has has had who had, uh, who has control over some system like that, and then also uh, blockchain systems I think are, are very good at, at decentralizing power and decentralizing monetization, and I think that those things will will support each other, in 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 very substantive ways. It's more uh, it's more a question of like where do we focus our efforts and, and what do we work on? Because if we can get to a place where we're uh, let's say getting compensated for our own data. Right, right now we don't own our own data. Yeah. At some point through Web3, we can own our own data. And I think that will happen in our lifetime. There will be a, a, a focus more on you own your data and what happens to it, you know, becomes a little bit more uh, a little bit more focused on you. We don't have data restriction or privacy laws as much in the US. We'll get there eventually. Uh, um, but it's uh, on that topic by the oh, go on, go on, go on. I, I have a question. Yeah, okay, so so yeah, let, let, let's scoot back to that for sure. Um, so so I, I, I think that I think that that's gonna that that's gonna come. Uh, and I think that the AIs can help facilitate that a lot, especially in terms of distribution and permissions and what gets selected and what doesn't get selected. If I think of like an ideal health healthcare system, again, as kind of an example of this is I own the record of everything that's happened to me. If I want to contribute that to research pools or to hospitals or something, there's some sort of permissions. Now, the challenge with Web3 right now is the, the user interface, right? You can't get on and be like, oh, well, let me validate my let me validate the keys that are here and then it, it's confusing it's difficult i used the web3 based vending machine it was a very difficult experience to be honest uh, not that long ago but i think that ais can help to do identity verification and keep things like to kind of searching for who you are and who you are like being like uh, multi-channel verification right so that's harder to spoof a real human being and when you can get the, kind of the proof of human uh, you know, that that sort of concept, um, 
that integrates then with blockchain, you can use that for permission systems and, and the AIs will help to make a lot of decisions and, and to, to better uh, control the flow of, of that type of, of data and, and, and processing as we get to there, which will then link into Web3 and, and use tokens for lots of things, you know, for cracking or for, um, or for uh, compensation exchange of value. So that that would mean we we could use the AI as a friendly bot that allows you to spare yourself the cumbersome process of getting into the blockchain uh, sector and to um, the cumbersome pro process of understanding how it works. That, that mm -hmm. could be a positive aspect. Uh, regarding yep. data availability, I have a question that, yeah. that popped in my head when when you were talking about it. Um, do you think governments will let people reclaim ownership of that data? Because at the moment, the governments have, um, they always had a, an ambiguous relationship towards privacy because basically in most countries and most civilized countries, I, I'm saying this not uh, cynically, but, but, but I, I can understand why also it's, uh, it's important. But in most developed countries, you can't really hide stuff from the government. It's usually a punishable thing. And so how do you manage getting, uh, how, do you, how do you reclaim control over your data and over your privacy if basically the entity allowing you to do that is not allowing you to, to hide anything from them? Yeah, that's that's certainly a challenge. You have well, I mean, there's like ethical challenges involved with that as well. So like anytime human and, and ethics stuff get involved, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, I think that if that change comes and if that change happens, mm -hmm. it will probably be as a direct result of some sort of incentive. It's an incentive based thing. Anytime in business, you know, I've, I've had multiple uh, startups of my own and anybody of you who have done the same thing, you know, that uh, incentives control behaviors. And that's just the way that it is. I think that if we can get to a point where the where the incentive is for um you know for, for people to trust their own people then and you know that's a very lofty statement <laughs> we could we could spend hours and hours un unpacking what that looks like but i feel like that's what will um that's what will drive the needle some of that can come in form of uh you know either either social uh, pressure upward toward like, hey, this is something that we need, this is something that we want. If you start to see like the, the way that less legalization of marijuana has happened in the, in the US, the government still doesn't allow it, but everyone started saying, okay, yeah, but this is very good and I'm getting incentivized and we get more taxes and we get more whatever. So if there's some way to, to hook in with, uh, you know, take a lesson from that playbook and, and, and hook in some sort of like, you know, there's tax implications or, or there's monetary compensation or there's, or there's some sort of upward pressure. I think that's what can happen in, in the other countries. Um, yeah, I think it's a, that's going to be a struggle. That's going to be a struggle. And it, as it always has been with humanity, I think humans have always had people trying to control, right? There's always been some king or Xerxes or some power that's here and holding over, you know, in Europe, it used to be two families owned the entire yeah. country back in the middle ages. And then, when the incentive showed up, when the technology showed up, boats, they're like, oh, go get me more resources and I'll break you off a piece. I'll get you a little bit, right? And so you look at the, it, they started to decentralize a little bit the money for the merchant class. When the merchant class started having money, then they started giving some for artists and the Renaissance came, and, you know, and, and so this like, this decentralization has always in, in historically has, has always spurred innovation and spurred some change, you know, then you have, uh, you know, then you have the Dutch who open up the first, you know, publicly traded company, and they become wealthy beyond all measure because they decentralized the ownership of that company. And I think that we someone, someone, I don't know who it is, it won't be, it won't be the boomers. Um, but <laughs> it, <laughs> someone will realize, oh, yeah, hey, you know what? This actually goes very, very well for us when we decentralize mm -hmm. things. Life is better. My life is better. Everybody makes more money. And I think that when, when people catch on to that train, I, I think that we'll get there. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. You usually don't fight a system because the, the amount of energy necessary to, to disprove and, uh, and fight a system and convince people that this is, uh, the system is rigged is 
basically an order of man magnitude higher than what it takes to to just maintain the system so you th th that's beating a dead horse but no, finding something with a, a strong uh, moral or incentive to um, to build something next to it making the previous one obsolete is uh, is probably my, my preferred way as well um so yeah, I, I understand totally uh, what you're saying rega regarding empowerment and uh, regarding how it works. Thank you for the answer. And so, in your opinion, what are the next technical, business, and ethical challenges? Anything that comes to your mind when you think challenges regarding both the AI and the blockchain industry? These two are basically thriving. There mm. are s so many things that no expert in the world can keep up with everything that is published on a daily basis. So they have a lot mm. in common and they also have these huge ethical implications and potentially world-changing applications. W what are the challenges uh, that you think of? That's funny. I really appreciate those parallels, um, kind of comparing the two like that. And it's, it's super helpful. Um, there's the, the, the challenges are a few. Um, first is the, I, I suppose, if you look at just zoom back, there's, there's the development challenge, then there's the adoption challenge. <laughs> and it's, it's mostly, mostly comes down to, to, to those two. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at right now, um, the development challenge, I think, is people are working on it. You know, there's still there's still newer systems, but both of them. I mean, the concept of machine learning has been around for some time, and and has been happening for some time. Uh, and the you know blockchain Web three space has now been uh, 15 years or so. It's about 15 years old or almost. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's it's like that's it's in the grand scheme of things is is still very very new. Um, so there's going to be, there's, you know, we've, we've gone through the, the proving and the failure points in that system a lot. We'll have to do the same thing with AI. Um, you know, people will get, people will use AI for bad. And that's just the way that it, that it just, that's the way it is. I, I, I ultimately believe that people are good. That's my fundamental assumption. Everyone's well entitled to their own, but I think that we'll find ways to, to use it for good and and carefully think about how that we don't get taken over by you know some evil robot overlords. Uh, but uh, I think that, so there's so there's the the challenge of like people building people building good things and not trying to scam people out of their money or trying to use AIs to let, let's say like control the population. Um, so there's the, some of that on the building side. The AI will actually accelerate by itself because it's writing code or checking code or validating code. So, you know, uh, advance a few years down the road. And, and I think that the development challenges become become minimized some. Mm. And uh, and it, it allows some people, frees up some time for creatively, how do these things actually weave and dance together and play together in, in a very meaningful way. Um, and... And, you know, like, I'm not saying there's no there's no magic bullet. There's nothing that's going to fix it. It's not like, oh, well, the computer is going to get smart enough that it's all going to fix itself. That's that's not going to happen. Like, mm -hmm. we're still going to be heavily involved no matter what happens. Um, the other challenge is the, the compute power and the energy. That's, you know, gas fees are a real thing. And the, the concept of gas fees has not been really brought into uh, the AI world yet. Uh, but it is very expensive to run and train a model like like a gpt model i mean it's the it's the largest model we've ever trained there will be larger models trained um uh, but there's also smaller models so there's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of ais that, that will be able to uh accelerate certain components but we, we're going to get into the concept of gas fees with those two uh, especially on the generative ai side so it, i think that we're going to run into a challenge um and potentially um, sending some people who are smarter than myself to think about the issues of uh, the, the cost of energy. <laughs> that could be, uh, you know, that, that, that could be something that I think would be very fruitful to crossing some sort of um, uh, event horizon, I think, with, uh, with both Web3 and with AI. Fantastic. I love it. So... That's still something, uh, uh, basically a place where everything has to be done, right? It's uh, we're still in terra incognita so, um, for the next thirty years. 
And what do you think about, uh, because you're in this business, so I assume you, uh, just like myself, cannot keep up with everything that is published. <laughs> Nobody can. Uh, I'm close. And, you know, you know the, there was um, that uh, futurologist, um, Ray Kurzweil from Google. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy basically said, okay, we're going to reach some kind of singularity when basically the, um, the technologies evolve and change faster than we're, what we can keep up with so without even knowing it you'll be you'll be 10 years late actually you're just two months late but you're already obsolete 10, uh, by 10 years mm -hmm. compared to somebody else in one field and you're already at the state of the art in another field without even knowing it and yep. um, yeah it really looks like it like you, you have that the exponential curve that is that even has its own acceleration factor that is also exponential All right, mm -hmm. and uh, what are the the business implications, the business use cases you're looking forward to seeing in the next years, in the next decades? Yeah, um, you know something that I have been noodling on for some time is the ability. Uh, the, the one thing that chat uh, so chat GPT is a lot of things, and then it's also not a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. It's a generative AI. Uh, you know, it's very good at understanding language. It's very good at understanding intent behind language so you can sort of tag uh, intent and, and understand like w the meaning behind words, right? So what that what that says to me, right? Rather than being anything other than, than, than just what it is, it is a very meaningful API mm -hmm. for us to interact with computers. And that's what ChatGPT is. Right. It's a lot of things. You can you can spin it off into products. You can show up in, in whatever uh, whatever ways you want to. But what 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 I think the most meaningful impact is going to be if you look at right now, everything we use is is still um, very like almost command line. If, if you advance it a few years from now, in in terms of interacting, like I get in this this thing, my mobile phone here. Yeah. I want to change. The I want to hook up to Wi-Fi. I want to do Bluetooth. God forbid if I'm a 70-year-old woman, you know, who's like had a stressful day or something. Yeah. My, you get my, in here. My, my, like, mom is, my mom is 70 years yeah. old. And and she's, so, sometimes she comes to me very proudly and says, see, I was able to reboot that thing. And now she knows how to do it. But it took her, it took her years, years because right. she, she wasn't really and, keen on it. Yeah. And everything's menu driven, right? Everything's yeah. like, go click on here, then find here, and how to nest under this. And we have whole industries of people trying to figure out how to nest those things in a way that's not confusing. I, sometimes I think Facebook does it in a way that is confusing on purpose so that, like, you stay on the platform <laughs> as an example of, of, of someone else, you know, trying to nest a bunch of different features in there. But uh, where we're going very shortly is, you know, hey, phone, connect to the Wi-Fi, please. Oh, I'm going to connect you to the Wi-Fi. Do you have the password or, you know, whatever? And it'll verify that stuff. Um, so so that uh, most of the changes and most of the settings and the most of the way that you can interact with stuff, you can, uh, will be able to run an entire business vocally. Yeah. Just yeah. just by talking to an assistant, you'll be able to run run an entire business. Um, and and so I, I'm very excited about that. And that shows up in in not just like, oh, hey, you know, look at my sales data if I sell, you know, some energy shots or something as my business. Uh, but it, it, it would also show up in a lot of different Web3 applications. It's quite, right. Yeah, it's quite so, funny no, because in the 70s, people were basically thinking of year 2000 as, you know, some kind of science fiction era where we would have flying cars and so on. But Uh, and, and people thought that uh, sequencing DNA would take 500 years and having talking robots would take a lot of time. And actually, it, it's the other way around. So, yeah, I, yeah. I totally agree with that, with uh, the vocal uh, vocal thing. And this is where we're going. Do you, do you fear that it might make the, the population a bit dumber and less educated about how it works in the, in the back end? Or is it just that it's going to make life easier for people who wouldn't have educated themselves anyway? I think it's it's closer to the second one, to okay. be honest. I, I think that what what we face with education uh, is it's it's a challenge of a system of values hmm. more than it is uh, a challenge of 
capability or the existential need to get trained at some job or, or something like that. I think that in our educational systems and, and, and our foundational systems like religion that we start when we're young and we form a lot of our um, a lot of our map of what the world looks like, right? Not all of those say education is super important. <laughs> Not everybody. Some do, some don't. But if you say education is important, curiosity mm -hmm. is is a currency. Curiosity is a value in the world. Uh, and I, I think that if if we if we go toward that direction, I don't think I, I think it only accelerates us and it does not hurt us. Um, but again, you know, there's human behavior and adaption that, that comes with that. You know, maybe we see some rise of techno religions that you know will will allow people to <laughs> you know the, to 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 hold different systems of value that will that, that'll teach them perhaps, such things. Perhaps. Well, still, still, it's uh, um, the thing is there are going to be so many more, so much more room for different topics uh, that there are going to be higher level of abstractions we uh, of abstraction we already have huge level of abstraction at the moment like uh, people who are thinking about things that they have the luxury to think about because their mm -hmm. basic needs are met so when ai is going to kick in in our everyday life it's it's probably going to be something that is going to be even even strong, uh, stronger, and that's going to allow people to think about something. I, w I was researching on my phone so something, and the other day, and you know, I, I already saw the the GPT um, integration device from from Bing and um, and the, the LLM integration from from Google, and it's already saving me a lot of time. And and at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, okay, but it's all already telling me what to think in some way. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The models are still a little clunky, <laughs> but that's all. That's also how it happens. Uh, Guy Kawasaki said, "Don't worry, be crappy." <laughs> <laughs> like first generation tech is okay. You just build the tech, and you see what it becomes. All right. And uh, are there things that uh, that scare you about these tech, these pieces of tech? Um. So there's there's a few things, mm -hmm. and I'm not I'm not so like I'm not. Uh, doomsday terminator you know takeover style i think that uh there are there are a lot of things that come way before then and a lot of things that go wrong way before then um i one thing i think is if like uh we're, we're doing a lot of botting right now and this is going to be botting internally we can help internal processes inside of companies uh to you know let's say like do automated parts ordering understand the way that people can you know talk to machinery you know for fixing problems uh you know or there's like a, a lot of a lot of stuff like that that's like it's at that's at a simple level now right like i mean there's there's other integrations you look at like work auto or i'm sure everyone's done some zapier integration with something they're trying to build you know to talk to some other system you know apis have been a thing for a decade you know of like major major topic and everything has those now uh but if we get into the get into the stage where it becomes easier and you get some um clever and malicious actors mm -hmm. who let's say create a bot that either find a way to harvest a lot of uh, a financial system or take over uh you know some particular markets uh, you know, or, or shut down competition in the free market in some other places. You could see it probably won't happen in, in like large scale company, uh, large scale countries at first, but somewhere like Venezuela, you know, could be could be like a, a, a target or, you know, some like a, a other countries. You know, I don't know why that thought of that one very specifically, but you basically because of the sort of the <laughs> the evil republic there right and so if you if you have someone that harnesses it and and creates parameters on a system that only feeds and stokes fear mm. and, and and evil and things to to kind of keep people down uh, i think that it could it could run away it could run away pretty well. you could use those systems to control a lot of people with a very small amount of technology mm. and the opposite is true, right? You can liberate a lot of people through through, through such technologies. Uh, it's just, I, I don't know exactly how that shows up, or else I would, you know, start campaigning to shut it down or, 
or 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 just put like here's the here's the top five dangers in AI right now, and here's how to avoid them. Here's the pitfalls. Here's how to steal yourself against them. Much like we all know how to avoid a scammer, or ideally we know how to avoid a scammer. <laughs> um, that's another thing that's, that's that's crazy, right? It takes maybe 10, 10 minutes of vocal data. So if you have more than ten minutes of data uh, oh, interview right. from you on on YouTube or something, someone could spam spam your voice and you know tell your parents or your loved ones yeah, yeah. that you're you know, you're in prison and blah, blah, blah. So like, I, I'm some of that stuff's already happening now. So that stuff's pretty scary, too, because people don't really know how to discern um, and, and authenticate who it is. Yeah, that, that's or you have to do basically a proof of life protocol, like something secret. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Venezuela, because I was about to go there um, two weeks ago, I had to, mm -hmm. uh, the trip was cancelled, but uh, the US embassy was giving uh, cues and saying, okay, if you go there, uh, we recommend not to travel there, but if you absolutely have to, then please make a proof of life protocol, like, it's a special question that you're... Um, that your relatives are going to ask you just to make sure that you are you indeed have been kidnapped um and that uh, and that it's actually you like so if the kidnapper is saying something you have to to be able to answer a specific question and i found it interesting so maybe maybe there's going to to be some kind of secret info that nobody discloses online to protect themselves from ai yeah and if somebody can solve that problem i think it's a Ideally, there there's great uh, monetary compensation, but at the very least, I think that that's a, a something that's an incredible, incredible challenge and, and incredible give mm -hmm. to to people. If uh, if you want to think about how to how to solve for for that specific type of token, let's say. And also, what you're describing somehow is kind of what the the Chinese PCC's web, web dream is at the moment. I mean, they they are already using cryptocurrencies in their project. They want to have a um, Chinese yuan with a, with an expiration date so that you... Well, yeah, yeah, <coughs> the, the, uh, that's the, what they're thinking of. So you can't really have a... Um, you can't save money, and so that means you cannot st stockpile um, stuff and money in order to leave the country if, uh, if the government wants you to prevent you from going there. It's very hard to go. Um, so... Add that uh, to an AI that has a huge facial recognition tech and uh, many companies providing that. Uh, I know that in Australia, there um, many uh, many surveillance cameras are already provided by a Chinese company, and so they are obligated by law to disclose any information to the Chinese PCC. So that means Australia is basically under Chinese watch um, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So. With their social credit system, yes, I understand that it could empower many people, and I understand that that tech could also basically maybe free many people and help. Maybe we could have an AI that helps people avoid uh, avoid censorship or something like that. That's possible. Yeah, yeah I, I hope so. It sounds like we're closer to dystopia. <laughs> the, the way that, the way that that was that was painted. Uh, yeah. So again, data privacy and. <laughs> What, what technology and, and not only that, but foreign uh, foreign device data privacy is is important, and even even in a, even in a decentralized network, right? You run it out of wherever you run it out of. It's important to I think very important to talk about uh, privacy, what's allowed, what's not allowed, and 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 have some sort of like a code of tech ethics in 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 some fashion that would allow people to. You know, operate, and I know there's there's a lot of Web three is like, don't tread on me, no rules, you know, just leave me anonymized and everything's fine. And some to some degree, I agree with that, and to another degree, I think that I'm not saying regulation, but I am saying ethics. Yeah, which is very different uh, because regu yeah. regulation creates a static point in. Uh, in human interactions where ethics is opening things for reflection and that, that's uh, that's actually one of the things i find uh, sometimes very hard in uh, in the in these uh, the, uh, these places uh, in these to topics because it's hard to find people who are able to ha to have some respect for the position which is not their own position and so yep. are there are there other positive things you would like to share to to finish on maybe a more optimistic note 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think on an optimistic note, uh, AI is going to, in the, the way that I see the future, and we'll see, there will mm -hmm. be ripples, there will be problems, there will be stuff like this that we need to discuss. But I think overall, um, AI and, and Web3 uh, as well are going to allow us to free up more time to be more human. Nobody wants to push the button on the operator line all the time. Mm -hmm. Not really. You know, maybe they, they find the safety of, of having a, a, a repeatable pattern in their life calming. But I think that, that nobody really wants to do that. And so I think that the AI is being able to automate things, being able to generate value, being able to use, uh, let, let's say, some sort of a, a, a crypto system for distributing value. I, I very much think that we're going to need to go to a universal basic income. We don't have to go down the political road of that. I just think that the, the, the separation of where we're at, I think that we're going to need to be there at some point in time. And I think that's a beautiful thing because if people's needs are met, then they're able to focus on problems. And to be honest, we need all of humanity's best minds right now in order to solve the problem. So some so putting people onto a universal basic income to say like, hey, this is covered and this is covered and this is covered. We can get to a point where we'll be able to innovate, create artwork, uh, you know, share NFTs, share moments with our friends, and uh, you know, and it's not it's not not utopia. That will that's never that's not how it works. Like stuff's always you know a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But I, I think that we're going to get a lot closer, and I, I think it's a very it's a very good enabler, uh, and and both both the the AI and the and the Web three space will um, allow us to blend a lot better with with the technology that, that already exists in our life. Mm. For our listeners, there's not one universal basic income. There are at least uh, five, six, seven different trends of universal basic incomes. So it's a very tricky topic and very, com very complicated uh, outside it's of this field. But th that's very interesting. We should have maybe one discussion about th th that's uh, UB UBI. Well, that UBI and the blockchain industry or the AI industry to see how things would would merge with each other. Thank you so much, Frank. Any last words? Yeah, appreciate it, Gautier. Thank you so Thanks. much, everyone. You were listening to Mutual Knowledge Podcast. My guest today was Frank Human. I'm putting all his links in our description. Please like, share, and subscribe, and follow him. Bye, Frank. Yeah. Bye. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Happy to, to happy to chat.